Okay, so this is going to be a review of our first uh, unit uh, in preparation for uh, the first exam. Um, and uh, so this uh, material should look familiar. Uh, uh, we, I've gone over previous videos, but I'll try to combine these into to one video here. Um, and the first thing we talked about was some uh, statistical terminology. Um, uh, sample statistic or statistic is a summary number such as sample mean or sample proportion used to estimate the corresponding population parameters such as a population mean or population proportion. And here's an example, uh, a sample of several thousand voters in June 2020. The proportion favoring Biden was 52 percent compared to Trump's 44 percent. Uh, and we can use these sample proportions as estimates of the proportions favoring Biden compared to Trump and the entire population uh, of millions of voters. Um, so uh, each voter poll would be an observational unit or an observation or case. Um, and voter preference is a categorical or a qualitative variable. Um, this pollster also asks for ages of each voter polled. Age would be considered a numerical or quantitative or measurement variable. Uh, the above poll found that Biden had an even wider lead over Trump among younger voters. Uh, so in this context, the age of the voter could be considered an explanatory or independent variable, and the voter's political preference would be uh, considered a response or a dependent variable. Uh, in some cases, the independent variable may cause or affect the dependent variable, but cause is often hard to prove. Um, income could be considered to be a third or lurking or confounding variable because income was not reported and it might affect voter preference. Um, so that's some of the terminology that we were working with. Um, and then uh, after that we went into some of um, uh, very com computing various uh, statistics. Uh, we'll start out with uh, percentiles. Uh, roughly speaking, the, um, the percentile tells you how, how much, um, what proportion of, 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 the, of the population is uh, below that uh, uh, number. So, for example, the 58th percentile, if somebody's in the 58th percentile, that means their um, score or the value of the variable was higher than 58% of the data. Um, and um, so the, um, uh, there's a couple of formulas um, that we're using in computing uh, percentiles. Um, well, I'll go over some examples of this. Uh, we have P times N by plus 1 over 100 um, for, com um, uh, for computing the rank if you're given the percentile. And then um, uh, if you're given the rank, uh, there's another formula here, um, 100 R minus 1 plus 0.5 times the frequency uh, divided by N uh, rounded. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll, I'll give, oh, give some examples of that. Um, these are just some of the formulas that we're working with. The median or middle value or average of the two middle values, depending on uh, um, whether you have an odd number or an even number of data. Uh, quartiles, roughly speaking, the quart quartile is um, um, the um, data value that's more than 25% of the data, the first quartile. Um, and the third quartile would be more than 75%. Um, the, the way our book favors, there's a couple of ways of computing quartiles, but the, the method favored in our text is to, um, uh, for the first Q quartile would be the median of the values to the left of the median, uh, and the third quartile is the median of the values to the right of the median. Usually left would be, um, left of the median would be less than the median, or, the, or it could be equal to the median in some cases. Uh, to the right of the median, uh, if you're putting in order from left to uh, from smallest to largest, the rate of the median usually would be uh, more than the median, or in some cases it might be equal to the median. And again, we'll go over some examples of that. Um, the formula for the mean, um, it, this is the sum of all the data values. This uh, capital, Greek letter capital signal means sum of all the data values divided by n. Um, occasionally we will be working with a weighted mean. Um, and um, Oftentimes the weights will add up to one. In, this, in that, that case, you use the simpler formula here. It's just to um, multiply each score times its weight and then add them all up. Um, if the weights do not add up to one, um, then you have to divide by the, um, the sum of the weights. 
uh, in order to get the weighted mean. Uh, Mid-range, uh, the main measures of, this, of um, center are, are, are that we'll be working with the mean and median. Uh, Mid-range is another measure of center um, that's not used as much, but it's uh, the average of the maximum and the minimum uh, values. Uh, the range uh, is actually a measure of spread, the maximum minus the minimum. Uh, so that's the, uh, not to be confused with the mid-range, which is a measure of uh, center. Um, interquartile range, the, advantage of the, the disadvantage of the range is that um, uh, one number can have a big effect. So um, another uh, um, measure of spread that's not affected by outliers is the interquartile range, which would be the third quartile minus the first quartile. Um, and then the, the two that are the, probably the most important measures of spread are the variance of the standard deviation, especially the standard deviation, because there's a lot of important theorems uh, related to the standard deviation um, and also the variance. Um, and these are the formulas there. Um, uh, you want to uh, subtract each score from the mean from each score and then um, uh, multiply it by itself, square it. The formula tells you what to do. You want to first do what's inside parentheses, so each score minus the mean, and then you square it. Then you add them all up, and then you divide by n minus 1. That's for the sample variance. And the sample standard deviation would be the square root of the variance. Um, another measure of spread um, that, um, well, the disadvantage of this, one of the disadvantages of the, of the standard deviation is that um, um, it um, doesn't, doesn't really um, scale it to a, a data set. So if you have a, a, a if you have, an, let's say, exam scores on a scale of, of um, 0 to 100, um, a standard deviation of 1 would be, um, those scores would be pretty close together uh, uh, in relation to the, uh, how the, 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 um, the rest of the data. But if, the, if it's, it's a quiz score with uh, scores between 0 and 10, uh, then a standard deviation of, of 1 would be, uh, um, would be more spread out. Um, so the coefficient of uh, variation as a way of uh, sort of scaling the standard deviation to the particular data set. Uh, and the formula is uh, 100 times the standard deviation divided by mean. But you multiply by 100 to make it into a percent, so because it's usually expressed as a percent. Um, but, and again, I'll, I'll go over some examples of these uh, formulas. The z-score, um, we use that in a number of different contexts here in this course. Um, uh, so it's an important formula. It's the score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. Um, it, it tells you how many standard deviations from the mean a particular score is. And uh, generally, um, most of the data is within one or two standard deviations of the mean. Uh, one, standard, one or two standard deviations above the mean, or, or one or two standard deviations below the mean. Uh, there's a couple, of, here's a couple of theorems related to the standard deviation. Um, Chebyshev's theorem. The proportion of data within k standard deviations of the mean is at least 1 minus 1 over k squared. Uh, again, I'll go over some examples of these formulas. I'm just um, um, I'm just e expressing the formulas right now, but I, I'll, um, I'll, I'll go over some examples where we actually apply the, uh, some of these formulas. Uh, the empirical rule only applies to, to data with bell-shaped graphs, um, and that's 68% uh, of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. It's also called, called the 68-95-99.7 rule. 68% uh, of the data is within one standard deviation of the mean. 95% is within two standard deviations of the mean. 99.7% of the data is within three standard deviations of the mean. And then we went on over various types of graphs. Um, and the graphs can either show frequency or relative frequency or percent. Uh, relative uh, frequency is the frequency divided by the total. The percent would be 100 times uh, the relative frequency. Uh, and some of the dot plots, yes, we went over a dot plot where you put a dot for each case or uh, on top of the scale. Histograms and bar graphs where you have a bar over a scale. Um, and um, a pie chart, stem plot, um, box plot. Box plot is uh, a way of uh, um, it, it's, a, it's a good uh, graph if you want um, if you're mainly interested in symmetry versus skewness because it only uses the quartiles. Uh, scatter plot uh, is for two variable data. Um, 
and it shows the relationship between the two variables. Um, and we have a numerical way of showing the relationship between the two variables. That's the correlation coefficient. Uh, you, uh, you have two variables. You have the z-score for the, the x variable, multiply it by the z-score for the y variable, add up these product, divide by n minus 1. That's the correlation coefficient. And then once you have the correlation coefficient, um, you know, if, if these, um, not all data sets are, are, um, are close to a straight line, but if it's close to a straight line, uh, you're going to have, uh, um, uh, if the data values are close to a straight line, uh, the co correlation coefficient will be either close to 1 or close to negative 1. And you can actually compute the slope of that line. The best slope um, uh, is the correlation coefficient times the standard deviation for y over the standard deviation for x. And the, um, the best, the intercept of the best fitting line, uh, b, b is equal to y, the mean for y minus the slope times the mean for x. And there's um, um, some regression theorems here. The um, r squared um, is um, can be expressed as in terms of the uh, sum of the squared residuals by the uh, the total sum of squares. So the, the 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 best line, the best fitting line, is the one that minimizes this term here. That's the sum of the squared residuals. And again, I'll go over an example of that. Um, the, uh, the residual is the predicted value for y. That's y hat minus uh, um, minus the actual uh, value for. Actually, this is the the, uh, the residual here. This, um, uh, the actual actual minus the predicted. Uh, so this is the sum of the they're calling sum of squared errors. It's sum of squared errors here. Uh, but those are the residuals. Um, and uh, anyway, well, so I'll go over some examples. Uh, so here's some examples where we can actually um, apply some of these formulas. Uh, and um, so in this data set, uh, we have um, five students. And um, I seem to be missing the, uh, the data. Data set, but, uh, yeah, I'm, I, I think I don't have the full data set here, but um, the, we have uh, five students, and we actually have two variables. I'm not showing both variables here, but uh, uh, this, these are the, um, the amount of time the students spent watching TV, and then I also have some data on the amount of time they spent doing homework. Um, and we want to see how these two variables relate. But let's first of all just focus on the TV hours. Um, Anna spent one hour watching TV, uh, Ben two hours, Chelsea three hours, Dante four hours, Ellen uh, five hours. So if we add these up, uh, the total is 15. And then so the mean um, is going to be that total, which is 15, uh, divided by the number of students. We have five students. Um, so the mean uh, is uh, three hours. And then uh, we want to uh, compute um, uh, the each deviation from the mean. So and I spent one hour, so it's one minus three. That's each score minus the mean, square it. Um, so one minus three is negative two. Negative two squared is four. Um, and um, Ben is going to be two minus three, y squared. Two minus three is negative one. Negative one squared is one. Uh, Chelsea, three minus three squared. Three minus three is zero. Zero squared is zero. Dante, four minus three squared. One squared is one. Ellen, uh, five minus three squared. Two squared is four. So if we add these up, the total here is 10. Um, and then, so the variance um, is going to be, um, this is the variance for the x variable, um, it's going to be uh, this, uh, 10 divided by n minus 1. So it's 10 divided by 4, which is 2.5. Okay, so that's the, um, we're, we're just um, applying 
uh, these formulas here. So the um, the mean, uh, you want the, the total, the sum of all the scores divided by the number of scores. That's this part here, the 15 divided by 5. And then the, um, the variance is some of the squared deviations from the mean divided by n minus 1. Okay, and then we can also compute <coughs> um, the, uh, the standard deviation. Um, so uh, the standard deviation uh, it would be the square root of the variance. And uh, for that, we can use a calculator. Uh, and uh, a calculator here. OK, so, um, so, on. so it's second square root 2.5 equals and 1.58 something. Okay, and that's ours. Okay. Okay, so, um, okay, so, uh, We can also um, <coughs> find the uh, coefficient of variation, <coughs> standard deviation, square root of 2.5, which we just did, 1.58113883 hours. Uh, the coefficient of variation, it's 100 times um, standard deviation divided by the mean. So 100 times 1.58 and 13883 uh, divided by the mean, which was 3. And uh, again, we can do that on the calculator. Um, and that's um, really expressed as a percent. Um, so uh, I already have the 1.58 in there. So it's times 100. Um, divided by 3 equals, and uh, it's about 52.7%. 50, um, so the, um, the, the um, standard deviation is a little bit more than half of the mean. Okay, uh, the z-score for Ben. Well, Ben uh, watched two hours of TV. Um, so uh, it would be 2 minus 3 divided by standard deviation. Um, then uh, 2 minus 3 divided by 1.58, 1383. Um, okay, so two, 2 minus 3 equals negative 1. Oops. Uh, oh, yeah, there it is. And then uh, divide by, and I, I put that standard deviation in memory, I'll just pull it up from memory. Um, and about negative 0.63. So it's a, uh, so it's a negative z score. Ben score is a, a little bit l less than the mean. Um, okay, um, so that's the z score. Uh, now we're up to Chebyshev serum, uh, and according to Chebyshev serum, um, what proportion of students can we can we expect um, to to put in to watch? Yeah, right. I'm cutting and pasting here, I think. Um, can we expect to watch between one and and five hours of TV? Um, okay, so. Um, so for Chevy Sub Serum, we need to compute the z-scores for, in this case, 1 and 5. So um, the lower z-score is going to be uh, 1 uh, minus 3 divided by 1.58 and 1, 3, 8, 8, 3. 1 minus 3 is negative 2. And divide by the 
to 1.58 something. I get negative 1.2649. 11064 and the other z score that's for 5, 5 minus 3 so 1.58 13883 um, and that's actually the same thing except it's going to be positive generally k is the z score that's closer to 0 um, but in this case there's a tie, they're equally close to 0 so uh, we could let k be either either score. I'll say k is uh, the positive one, but you can take the negative one if you want. Um, but which one is if, if if one of them is closer to zero, then you want to take the one that's closer to zero. Um, okay, so um, uh, so then we can apply in, uh, plug this number k into the formula for everything. Um, so it's uh, 1 minus 1 over k squared, and it's at least, um, at least that much. Um, so it's uh, 1 minus 1 over 1.2649 and 1 over 64 squared. When you square a negative number, it uh, comes out positive. Uh, if you square a positive number, it comes out positive. And then we have this other minus sign, which makes it negative. Um, but I anyway, you'll, you'll get the same result if you put it in negative 1.26 for the uh, positive 1.26. Um, you have to be a little bit careful about how you put uh, negative numbers into the calculator. Uh, so I, I prefer to, um, to work with the positive 1.26. But um, uh, you know, if you put it in cor correctly, uh, it should work either way. OK, so, um, so it's 1 minus uh, the 1.26 something and squared, oops, uh, no, 1 minus 1 divided by, and I'll call that uh, from memory, and squared equals, I get 0 0.375. So um, the proportion of uh, scores between um, a, a, a portion of uh, values of the variable between 1 and, and 5 um, is at least um, 0.375 or, or, um, or you could it's often more convenient to put it as a percent um, uh, 37.5 percent at least at least that much uh, TV um, I, at least that proportion of students watch that much TV um, okay, so let's shove you shove. Um, and um, now, if if the um, if the de if we know that the um, uh, the amount of TV that people watch follows a bell-shaped uh, uh, graph, then we have a much stronger rule, the empirical rule. Um, so this, this um, Chevy shove there applies to any data set. It could be. Um, uh, it could have, uh, it could be a very skewed data set, it could be have uh, more than one peak, it, um, but the, um, um, uh, the empirical rule um, is for, for graphs that follow, follow a bell-shaped curve, and it's a much stronger conclusion. So the graph of the data would look something like this. You have a lot of people um, um, in the middle um, where have a, near the average number of TV hours, and then a few people watch a lot more, and a few people watch a lot less, but you have a sort of a bell-shaped graph there. In that case, if that's the case, uh, we have a stronger rule uh, that says that 68% um, um, of, of the um, students would, 68% um, of the data would be within one standard deviation of the mean, 95% within two, and so forth. Um, so we want the proportion of students that watch between uh, 1.41 uh, and 4.58 hours, and we need to make this into z scores uh, again, uh, like we did uh, for the Chevy Chef serum. Um, so it's going to be uh, the lower z score 1.418861117 minus the mean, which is um, 3. Um, 
divided by the standard deviation, which is um, 1.58 something. Uh, okay. Um, and uh, this, um, I believe, comes out to be um, negative 1. Let's see, 1.4188. Six one one seven minus three equals, and then divided by. And I'll call the standard deviation from memory equals equals. Uh, hmm, didn't work. Uh, I did something wrong. One point four one eight eight six one one seven minus three equals divided by. Second recall equals equals. Yeah, negative one. Um, and the other z score, um, uh, 4.58 something. One, three, eight, eight, three. Uh, minus the mean, which is three, divided by the standard deviation. And, um, Let's put this in and see what we get. 4.58113883 minus 3 equals um, divided by second recall. And I get positive 1. Okay, so th these z scores are negative 1 and positive 1. So that's the, um, the be the first percentage. If you have z scores of negative 2 and 2, um, that would be the second number these scores of ne negative 3 and 3, that would be the third number, the 99.7. Uh, but these are between uh, negative 1 and 1, so the answer is 68%. Uh, so 68% of the students watch between 1.4 uh, and 4.58 hours of TV. Okay, so, um, so that's a, a much stronger rule. For, for Chevy Chev, um, uh, we had um, a much wider um, range, not, not just from 1.4, but all the way down to one hour, uh, all the way up to five. We had much uh, uh, bigger range of uh, values, and uh, the most we could say was 37.5 percent. Uh, and here we have a, a, a narrow or a range, and we're saying 68%. So the empirical rule uh, is a stronger rule. Um, the other variable, uh, the y variable, was the homework hours. Um, and uh, so we have data from these same students. Um, Anna spent five hours on homework. Ben, three hours. Chelsea, two hours. Dante, zero hours. Ellen, zero hours. Uh, so the total is 10, and we can get um, the mean for homework. Mean for TV was three hours. Mean for homework, um, the Y bar uh, is going to be 10 divided by five students is two hours. Um, uh, so when we get the uh, the deviation from the mean, then would be um, I'm going to subtract two each value minus two. Five minus two squared, negative three squared, which is nine. Um, three minus two squared, one squared is 1, 2 minus 2 squared, 0 squared is 0, 0 minus 2 squared, negative 2 squared is um, 4, 0 minus 2 squared, negative 2 squared is 4. So the total um, is 18. Um, so the, the, the uh, variance, we have four students um, so, variance for the y variable, sy squared, is 18 divided by 4, which would be 4.5. Okay. Um, okay, so let's do the, um, the standard deviation for homework hours. That's going to be the square root of the variance. Uh, so it's square root of 
and um, I'll put that in the calculator. Second square root, 4.5, we get uh, 2.12 something. 3, 2, oh, 3, 4, 4. Okay, so um, I'm going to store that in memory. Um, and then we can um, uh, use this information to compute the, the correlation coefficient. Um, remember the uh, correlation coefficient, you want to multiply each the z-score for x times the z-score for y, add them all up, and then divide by n minus 1. So that's the, the formula t actually tells you how to do it. Um, see if I can find that formula again. Um, there we are. So what you first want to do what's inside parentheses. So inside parentheses, e score minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. That's the z score for x. Uh, and the same here is the z score for y. Multiply them together, add them up, divide by n minus 1. You, know, you follow the order of operations. You do what's inside parentheses first. Uh, then you do uh, addition before you do it. Um, a short division comes before addition, but a division bar that goes all the way across comes last uh, in the order of operation. Um, okay, so um, so this is a lot of computation. We we did um, we did the z-score for um, for Ben here already. This is for um, for the the homework hours. It says Ben score um, was was. Um, um, Two hours of TV um, minus the mean divided by standard deviation. So the the um, uh, anyway the um, so you do this for each of the students. You do the um, z score for <coughs> for homework for each of the students. The z score for um, uh, this is z for z score for TV here. Z score for homework for each student. Multiply them together and then add up these and. Um, and then you have five students, you want to divide by four. So the total here, negative 3.87 something, divide by four, and you get negative uh, 0 0.96 something. Um, so that's the correlation coefficient. And, um, and then once you have um, the correlation coefficient, um, um, that's the hardest part of the computation for, um, um, once you have that, you, uh, it's, uh, you can compute the slope, and it's not so bad to compute the slope. Well, um, mathematicians often use the letter M for the slope. Um, uh, our calculator uses the letter A for slopes. Uh, usually, statisticians like the letters A or B for the slope. Uh, but uh, anyway, um, just following our calculator here, we um, uh, use the letter A for the slope. But, um, so it's going to be um, the correlation coefficient times um, by the way, this is a, a strong positive correlation, a strong negative correlation, rather. Uh, it's close to negative 1, negative 9 point something, negative 0 0.9 something, rather. It's close to negative 1. So um, the correlation coefficient is always between negative 1 and 1. And if it's close to negative 1, that's, uh, it's close, that means it's as close to a straight line with negative slope. Uh, the slope line goes down. So if you plot the graph, it will all be close to a straight line with, with negative slope. Um, and um, if it has um, a positive correlation, it would, it would be a positive slope. So if it had a positive slope, correlation would be going up as you go left to right. Um, uh, the best slope, r times the standard deviation for y divided by the standard deviation for x. So r, um, uh, we just computed with negative 0.9 something. Uh, 6, 8, 9, 6, 2. Seven nine uh, standard deviation for y um, uh, is two point one two something. And standard deviation for for x um, is um, one point five eight something. By the, by the way, I um, I didn't mention the um, 
uh, proportion of variability. That's another um, uh, statistic that we can compute. But anyway, the the uh, this one here, um, the best slope. Um, if we do this computation. Um, Let me put this in memory, this, this, this correlation coefficient. Uh, <coughs> negative, um, negative uh, 0.96896279. I'll store that in memory so I don't have to type it each time. Um, <coughs> so it's the correlation times, and I recall the standard deviation for y, the 2.12 2 something, and then um, divided by, and I call the standard deviation for x equals, so this is negative 1.3. Uh, that's TV, um, homework hours per TV hours. Okay, negative 1.3. Um, the uh, the y-intercept, our calculator uses the letter b. Um, mathematicians also like the letter b for the y-intercept. Um, it's going to be um, y bar minus a times x bar. So the mean for y was 2. Uh, the best slope is negative 1.3. So we'll have a double negative there. The mean for x was 3. So a double negative is positive. So this is 2 plus 1.3 times 3, and that comes out to be 5.9 <coughs> hours of homework, so that's the intercept. So the equation um, is going to be in the form of uh, y equals a times x plus b, so this the y variable is the homework, and the slope is uh, negative 1.3, x variable is uh, tv, and uh, the intercept is 5.9. So this is the equation for predicting um, <coughs> homework hours from based on TV hours. And um, we can verify these computations um, with, um, there's a calculator program actually that does it. Um, and uh, yeah, and push, push uh, clear while holding on, then clear. Then uh, second data, uh, right arrow, push equals or enter data, and then put in all the data values step bar, and then you can scroll using the arrow keys to get the uh, uh, the mean for x, the standard deviation for x, the mean for y, standard deviation for y, the slope, the intercept, and the correlation coefficient. And um, I didn't mention that before, but uh, there's another statistic um, that's sort of uh, related to um, correlation coefficient, uh, the co uh, proportion of variability uh, 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 is R squared, um, and um, in this case it's uh, negative point nine six eight nine six two seven nine squared. My sign is squared, so it's always going to come out to be negative. So when you, if you put it in the calculator, you have to be careful about how you put it in the calculator. Uh, to make sure you're squaring the minus sign, or you can just uh, uh, you can just ignore the minus sign because if you, if you know it's going to come out to be uh, positive uh, anyway. Um, so uh, I do second recall because I put this in memory here, and then x squared equals. Um, so this is, is uh, zero point nine three eight 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 eight. Um, and this is often expressed as a percent, so it's, it's approximately 0 0.94, let's say. And um, it's the percent of the um, y variable that can be explained by the x variable. So, um, and this, and this, for this particular example, it's a pretty high percent. If you can't go over 100 percent, this is 94 percent. So 94 percent of uh, the variance of uh, uh, homework hours can be explained by TV hours.
Um, okay, so um, okay, the residual. Uh, I, I mentioned a little bit about the residual before. Um, the um, Yeah, this is, they're calling it sum of squared errors, SSE. Each um, uh, observed value of y minus each predicted value of y squared, add them up. And the, the best fitting line is the one that minimizes this uh, sum of squared residuals or sum of squared errors. Uh, so, uh, uh, so if we want to do the prediction error for Anna, uh, Anna's. Uh, um, And I w had uh, five hours of homework and one hour of TV. Uh, so, um, and uh, uh, this uh, one hour of TV and five hours of homework. Okay. So, um, so we can use the equation. Um, so, um, uh, sometimes a hat is. Uh, it means predicted values. This hat is used in other contexts too, but uh, homework with a hat on it means the predicted value of the homework. Um, and that's um, for Anna. Um, it's um, negative 1.3 times 1 uh, plus 5.9. Uh, so this is going to be uh, 4.6 hours. Um, so um, and it's predicted homework was 4.6 hours, um, and um, her actual homework um, and actual homework was uh, five, five hours. So the residual um, uh, is the actual what I observed minus the predicted. And, and in this case, uh, the predicted, the actual is five. The predicted is 4.6, so it's 0 0.4 hours. So you can compute the residual for each um, of the students. So this first line here is Anna's, um, and it had a residual of 0.4. Um, for Ben, uh, Ben's residual uh, was a negative 0.3. So Anna's um, uh, dot. Uh, if, if you on the graph, Anna's dot is a little bit above the prediction line. She, uh, Anna has a positive residual. Ben's uh, is a little bit below the predicted line. Ben has a negative residual. Um, uh, and um, so Chelsea, um, um, the predicted is the same as the actual, so that the residual there was zero, or prediction error is zero. Um, and um, Dante and Ellen. Uh, Dante was below the line, Ellen was above the line, but anyway. Um, and um, so those are the residuals. And um, if we if we square these numbers, uh, the minus sign goes away. And if we add these up, we'll get a, a number here. This is called the sum of the squared residuals. And there's a theorem that says that the um, um, that the the um, um, the line that we created. Uh, using those formulas um, is the line that gives the smallest sum of squared residuals. So this is going to be the sum, smallest sum here. That any other line uh, would have a, a bigger number than 1.1 here. Um, and you can also do uh, put a scatter plot uh, on the scatter plot. I um, the green line is the prediction line, and then I plotted the, the, the data. So um, for for Anna um, it was one hour TV and five hours of homework, so I'll go one to the right, up five. Um, for Ben, two hours of TV, three hours of homework, so it's one to the right, up three, and so forth. Uh, so the red dots are, would be the, um, uh, the, the, dot, the, the data for each of the students, uh, and the green line is the, um, the, the best fitting line. Um, and you can actually see the residuals uh, right on, on the graph here. The, the dots that are above the line have a, a positive residual, uh, the ones that are below the line have a negative residual. Uh, we have that one dot that was right on the line. 
um, that was uh, exactly the same as the predicted. Um, <coughs> okay, so um, okay, so I um, I'll go over some of the other types of graphs um, with the with <coughs> The, the, the first data set, I, I made the, a small data set, um, um, and um, it's, um, I, I want to go, when I, I, I made that small because uh, it involved, uh, some of these formulas involve a lot of computations, um, but um, this next example is a, a larger data set. Um, and um, I'm not going to try to do as much computation with this, but I'll, I'll go over some graphs. Um, so we have um, the data on um, 10 newborn babies. Uh, we have the weight of each baby, and we have the, the sex of each uh, baby. Um, so we have uh, five females and five males. Um, and um, the weights are in ounces. Uh, uh, the lightest baby was 60 Jorn. 62 ounces. The heaviest one was, uh, I think, Ico, 132 ounces. Um, so, um, so the the weight it would be uh, numerical data, uh, that, and there are certain kinds of um, statistics and graphs we can do with no numerical data. Uh, the sex is uh, what's called categorical data, um, and there's. Um, there's more, we're more limited than what we can do with categorical data, but there's some stuff we can do with that. Um, so we'll work mainly with the, um, with the um, numerical data, the weights. Uh, so one type of graph is um, a stem plot, also called a stem and leaf plot. And um, so for the stem plot, we put a, um, um, the, the stems would be the first one or two digits. Uh, the leaf would be the last digit. Um, and we put uh, each person's weight into this uh, uh, plot here. So for ICO, um, 132, the stem is going to be 13, the leaf is 2. So in, in row 13, we put, want to put a 2 for ICO. Um, and then for Bajoran, uh, I'm going to put a 2 in row 6. And 62, that represents 62. Uh, Christiana, a 2 in row 10. Uh, Deshaun, nine in row nine. Um, Enrique, a one in row eleven. Uh, Felicia, an eight in row nine. Um, Gabriel, a two in row ten. Uh, Hassan, a five in row nine. Uh, Isaac, uh, six in row ten. And Janita, a five in row ten. Okay, so um, so in row row nine we have three different babies. This nine here is ninety nine ounces. The eight um, represents ninety eight ounces. Uh, the five is ninety five ounces. Row ten we also we have four babies. Um, the first two is one o two. Second two is one o two, and one o six and one o five. Now, um, I'll call this step one. Usually you want to write these leaves in order from smallest to largest. So let's redo this. Um, um, and put them in order from smallest to largest. So this would be 5, 8, 9 in row 9. And uh, 2, 2, 5, 6. And row 10, and the rest of it's going to be the same. Okay, so um, uh, so then we can talk about the shape of the of the, of the graph. Um, I would say this is approximately symmetric because you have this one big hump in the middle, uh, and then you have uh, it kind of tapers off at, at the at the at the left and the right. When you when you look at the graph, you actually want to. Um, Usually, you want the scale to be um, horizontal, so you can turn this sideways. Um, and let's see if I have another colored pen here. Um, so and sometimes it helps to sort of 
draw out the sort of the overall shape of it. So um, or something like this. Um, and so it's it's a somewhat bell-shaped graph. Um, for for a small data set, it's not going to be uh, exactly bell-shaped, but it looks like it's um, looks like it's some, at least somewhat bell-shaped here. Um, and we have one main cluster, and then we have uh, kind of tapers off on the two ends, uh, and it's, it's more or less symmetric. Um, uh, we have outliers of. Uh, of uh, 62 and, and 132 is outlier is a data set that's very different from from the other data. So we have a little bit of gap here, especially the 62. Um, so outlier is important because um, um, there might be something particular uh, about that um, case. Uh, it could be a typical graph with an error. In this uh, or this example, it could be a, a baby that was born prematurely. Um, so it's outliers are something to pay attention to. Also, another reason to pay attention to outliers is that they can affect your summary statistics. Um, uh, so it, it can affect the, the mean, not so much the median, but it, has, it could have a big effect on the, on the mean um, and some of the other statistics. Um, we could also do separate box plots for the, or semi leaf plots for the males and females. So ICO was, um, 132 ounces uh, is a, is a uh, female, so I put a two, 2 on the female side. Um, Bajoran, 62 ounces was a male, so I put 2 on the male side. Um, Christiana, 102 is a female. Um, and uh, Deshaun, 99 is a male. And uh, Enri Enrique, 111 is a male. Um, Felicia, 98 is a female. Um, Gabrielle, 102, a female. Hassan, 95, male. Um, Isaac, 106, male. And Janita, 105, female. Okay, and um, you could also put these in order from, um, usually the smaller, smaller numbers would be close, uh, close to the center, um, so um, and then as you go out from the center you get into the larger numbers, um, uh, so put the fives before the nine here. One and the rest of it will be the same. Um, okay, so um, so it looks like um, the the females in this for this particular example, the females babies tend to be a little bit heavier. Um, but there's quite a bit of overlap. There's a lot of a lot of babies that are kind of clustered in the center here for, for both uh, sexes. Um, so it's sometimes it's useful to um, do a split uh, stem plot. Um, you can also, um, a side-by-side -side stem plot. Uh, you can also, uh, if you have a large data set, not so much for this data set, we'll do it with, for this data set, but if you have a large data set, uh, sometimes it's helpful to um, have um, more than one row 10, for example, more than one row 11. So what you do is you um, um, you would put um, leaves 0 to 4 in the first row 10 and leaves 5 to 9 in the second row 10 and so forth. So if we did one for the females, um, uh, let's see, we have um, um, We'll have that eight. This will this will be the second uh, row nine here. We'll put an eight there, um, and then we have in the first row ten we have uh, two and two, and the second row ten we'll have a five, uh, and the first row thirteen we have a two. Okay, so that's um, 
uh, it's a, a, a split stem plot where we're splitting each row into two different rows. So it leaves 0 to 4 would be in the first row 10, leaves 5 to 9 in the second row 10, and so forth. Uh, so that's useful if you have a large data set. It's not so helpful for this data set um, because this, our, this data set is relatively small. Um, Okay, the, uh, the median, um, we, we have uh, 10 babies, so that's, a, a, that's an even number. Uh, so we'll take the average of the two uh, uh, that are in the, in the middle. So we put them order from smallest to largest, left to right. And the two that are in the middle are both uh, the 102. So the median is going to be an average of those two numbers. 102 plus 102 divided by 2, and that's 102 ounces. And then um, uh, Q1, uh, we take, so the median, um, um, it, when they're written in smaller, in order from smallest to largest, uh, uh, you want to uh, split them at the median. So <coughs> it's not, Usually, most of the numbers will be less than the median, but in this case, we'll have one one of the 102s is equal to the median. So, because the median comes between the two 102s, we're going to put one 102 with the, with the lower half, and another 102 with the upper half. So, um, um, so we'll have five numbers there uh, to the left of the median here, uh, and we Q. That's an odd number, so that we only have one in the middle. So the, the 98 is going to be the one that's in the middle. That's going to be Q1. Um, some books use court, uh, percentiles, uh, and, and um, but and our book sort of mentions that uh, Q1 is a, um, uh, roughly speaking, is the 25th percentile, and so um, some books will actually um, just um, define the, the first quartile as equal to the 25th percentile, <coughs> but um, you know, but our book uses a method of repeated medians. So <coughs> sometimes it'll come out to be a little bit different than the 25th percentile. Um, but anyway, uh, so our median here was, uh, I mean, uh, the, the median of the scores below the median is Q1. That's going to be 98 ounces. And then um, we want the median of the scores to, to the right of the median. Again, at 5 is an odd number. The one in the middle is uh, the 106. Um, so 106 is going to be Q3. So Q3 is, uh, is uh, 106 ounces. And then um, there's a, there's a um, uh, plot that's based on the quartiles. And it's called the box plot, also called the box, uh, uh, box and whiskers plot. <coughs> and um, the box goes from Q1 to Q3. Um, so box goes from Q1 to Q3. So in this case, we'll be go from 98 to 106. Uh, and then the line inside the box is for the median. That's at 102. And the whiskers go out to the minimum and the maximum. So it's, uh, the whisker goes out to 62 and 132. So uh, the whisker on the left is uh, it's a little bit longer than the one on the right. So it's maybe a very slightly skewed uh, left. But uh, here I'm calling it approximately symmetric. Um, so that's a, um, uh, that's a box plot. Um, uh, a histogram, another type of graph. Um, and uh, you first want to um, group the data. Um, you know, for a histogram, you, uh, you don't want it too crowded. Uh, so sometimes, um, Especially if you have a large, large data set, you want to group the data. <coughs> you for the graph, you know, if you have too much detail in graphs, it's sometimes it's hard to see the, the overall pattern. Uh, so the, the, the detail kind of obscures the, the pattern sometimes. So, <coughs> um, so I group these by, by tens. Uh, we had um, one, one baby in the 60s, um, and nobody in the 70s, nobody in the 80s. Uh, we had three babies in the 90s, four, 100 to 109, uh, one baby 
110 to 119. Nobody. Okay, so um, I got ran, I ran out of time, so I have to restart this uh, this lesson here. But anyway, the um, um, histogram. Um, uh, if you have large data sets, you, you want to uh, uh, usually you want to group the data um, so that um, uh, because um, uh, too much detail can sort of obscure the overall pattern. Um, uh, for this example, um, I grouped these by 10. Um, so uh, we had one baby in the 60s, nobody in the 70s or 80s, three babies in the 90s, four babies in, uh, between 100 and 109, one baby 110 to 119, uh, nobody in the 120s, and one baby in the 130s. Um, so sometimes they, they also um, uh, are interested in relative frequency. So you can uh, you could also do relative frequencies um, um, if you want to do the relative frequency. You just divide by the number of babies. So one divided by 10, 0 0.1, 0, 0. 3 divided by 10 is uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.1, 0, 0 0.1. Uh, you could also do percent. Um, you know, it doesn't really matter um, so much um, the, the shape of the graph. It's not going to affect the shape of the graph. But if you if you multiply by 100, you make these into percent. So this would be 10% uh, um, of the babies were in the 60s. Uh, this is zero percent, zero percent. Point three times hundred, thirty percent. We're in the nineties, forty percent, ten percent, zero, ten percent. So um, when you make your your um, um, scale here, you can use frequency or relative frequency or percent, um, and um, and then the other scale would be for the values of the variable. Usually, the for um, a bar graph, the the um, the variable will be the horizontal scale, and the frequency will be the vertical scale. Um, but it, um, it it doesn't have to be that way. You can you can switch them if you want. Uh, and uh, so then, uh, for in the 60s, we make the bar going up to one. Um, for in the 90s, we make the bar going up to three. 100 to 109, bar goes up to uh, 110 to 119, the bar goes up to 1, and then um, in the 130s, the bar goes up to 1. So again, the um, it's approximately symmetric, um, and uh, you have one main cluster in the middle, so it's somewhat bell-shaped here. Um, okay. Um, Uh, we can also use a, a pie chart. Um, pie chart is not usually used in professional publications, um, but um, it uh, it's used in popular publications. Um, so we, we the pie chart also called a circle graph. So we make a big circle here, and uh, because we have ten babies, uh, we want to divide it into ten um, pieces. I'll try to make these equal. I'm kind of oddballing it here. I'm probably not exactly right, but um, okay. So we have um, one one baby in, in, uh, in the 60s. One baby uh, 60 to 69 ounces. Uh, we had um, three babies in the 90s, so we have three slices of pie here, the 90s, three babies, uh, 90 to 99 ounces. Uh, we have um, four babies, 100 to 109, so that's four slices of pie. Um, and one baby, 110 to 119. And one baby um, in the 130s.
Okay. Um, so there we have the, um, uh, the pie chart. Uh, one advantage of the pie chart is it can be used for categorical data. Uh, it doesn't have to be numerical data. Um, a dot plot, um, you put a bot, dot for each birth weight. Uh, advantage of the dot plot, you don't lose information like you do some of the other graphs. Um, it's, our, our graph is a little bit small for a dot plot. Um, I, I think a dot plot, the shape shows up better if you have a, a larger data set, so like 50, maybe 50 uh, babies. Um, so um, we had one baby 62 ounces, so we put a dot there. Um, and um, uh, let's see, in the 90s we have 5, 8, and 9. Those are all kind of very close together. Um, we have two babies 102, so if you have two of the same weight, you want to stack the dots. Uh, and then 5 and 6. Uh, and um, 111. And um, 132. 110, 120, 132. Okay, so that's our dot plot. Again, it's, um, uh, you have one big cluster in the middle. Uh, you could s it's still basically the same shape here. And have the one cluster in the middle, and then it uh, tapers off on the left and the right side. Uh, okay, so, um, um, now, a bar graph is, is like a histogram, uh, but um, for categorical data, uh, instead, of a, a, instead of a numerical scale here, you have a categorical scale, uh, and it's called a bar graph instead of a histogram. And uh, the, 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 um, the other scale, the frequency scale, is the same, and it could be relative frequency or, or percent. Um, I just made the, the, the regular frequency. Um, and we have two categories. We have male and female, so the, we have five of each. So the bar for each goes up to five. And uh, for a bar graph, um, uh, you usually leave uh, gaps between the bars, uh, like equal size gaps between each bar. <coughs> and and um, that's just um, a, a, a clue that it's, it's not a numerical graph. Um, you know, the, the um, the, uh, the histogram is for a numerical scale, and um, we have some gaps, but we don't have, n but uh, where we, we don't have any babies, but um, uh, we have, uh, there's not necessarily equal size gaps between each bar. Um, for, but for, uh, uh, for categorical data, we have uh, equal size gaps between each bar. Um, <coughs> if the bars are in order from uh, the uh, the tallest to the shortest, or shortest to tallest, is called a Pareto chart. Um, and that concludes this presentation.